three, two, live. Farts. Old farts. Two old farts. Steve and Dave. Sometimes you find a diamond in the rough. Not this time, though. This is just rough. Two old farts. There is no better waste of time. Two guys. Two old guys. A lot of BS and more drivel than you can shake a stick at. Steve and Dave. God help us. Every time I see that, I just, I get, I just feel so wonderful because you know, you have that God thing going for you. So, oh, well, as we've discussed before, Stephen, you're dyslexic and it's actually dog. I think. I know, help us. I know. I know. Maybe, I've, okay, maybe I've written it wrong. Maybe, maybe it is God that'll help us. But you know, um, someone should help us. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm very yeah, excited. I have our next let, guest. letters regularly for the doctor saying, you know, would you do, do you need help? You know, because yes, it's that's why I memorize the eye, I memorize the eye chart so I don't have to wear glasses. So yes, I, I need lots of help. I think. So. <laughs> oh well, I lost so that today, test a long time ago. So you lost that test. So today we have a very interesting guest. So I'm gonna when we bring okay. her on, I'm gonna we'll tell everybody how we discovered her. She's not that she needs to be discovered, but how we found her and asked her to come on the show. Um, but she yeah. deals with the company cultures and company DNA and whatnot. So I've got a list of questions because our culture here is a great culture at Two Old Farts Making Noises because we beat you until your attitude changes. Um, and so we have big paddles for all the interns. And, you know, they appreciate that tough love, I think. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I thought, I thought it was like rock, rock. I thought we would just we just do standard company policy, which is rock, rock, scissors. Was it rock, scissors, paper? Rock, scissors, that paper. Yes, that's was, the only is that, is that how we decide what we're doing next? That's how we decide. I, I, that's how know, our board meetings are. Yeah, I mean, that's three tasks that I'm just about to manage. So that's pretty good. <laughs> Congratulations. So, I'm, I'm very I'm just, proud for you. I just, I just hope, I just hope we, can, we can have a lot, more, a lot more useful information going forward today. I, I think so. Kristen is going to be able to um, help us with that. So let us bring Kristen in. And welcome to the Hello. show, Kristen. Hi. Hi Kristen. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. And and Kristen is going to help not only us, but other companies improve their company culture and their DNA and whatnot. Now, with that being said, so everybody knows how we found Kristen. You had a post on LinkedIn. And I love this. It says, there's no bad employees, just bad managers. And as we were talking to Kristen before the show, I said, I agree with that 95%. And she said it caused a big stir on LinkedIn. So I want to hear about the stir. Then I want to hear how you got into this and you know, what you do and whatnot, because of the stir, we love to stir things up. So very excited about the stir. <laughs> yeah, I think that statement is a bit of provocative statement, mostly because people, everyone has known an employee that they didn't feel like was a good employee, right? The reason that I make that statement, the reason that I think that statement is important is because it's a way leaders can think about what they do. So when I use it, I use it to help a leader uh, to have a certain kind of mindset. The mindset, which is, if the employee is not meeting my expectations, maybe it's something that I'm doing that's causing them not to meet those expectations. So maybe I'm not communicating them clearly. Maybe I'm not getting them the resources that they need to do them. What is it that I can do that can help make that employee a good employee? And so when I use this all the time with my clients and it's not, it's not the best phrase for every client. And we can talk about why that's the case in a minute, but for a lot of clients, getting them to think that way is not like, that is not second nature to them. That is not how they normally think about uh, leadership. So it's important for us to be able to shift that mindset a little bit. Um, but I think on LinkedIn, what happened is that people saw it and thought, okay, now we're putting leaders down, right? There's a lot of people right. on LinkedIn that yeah. a lot of leaders, those kinds of things. Well, now we're saying that it's always the leader's fault. And we know that's not the case, right? It's not always the leader's fault. But it, we should first ask ourselves what it is that we're doing as a leader that might be causing this problem. So 
the post kind of ran away with itself, right? And saying, we're, we're letting employees be entitled. They don't have to do anything. Uh, we're we're uh, building this idea with leaders that you can never give up on an employee, so to speak, or we can never let an employee go. And uh, any of my clients would know that I don't necessarily agree with that. I've often had to push them into, you know, letting a, a toxic employee go, that sort of thing. Uh, but it, it was truly interesting. No, I, like I said, when I read that, I was like, no, love that. We have to, we have to actually have this person on because I agree with you. See, I was brought up very old school, you know, because I was around when the earth cooled. So we were brought up that you have to mentor your employees. And after you mentor them and you really work with them and you try to get them to be the best that they can be, if they can't at that point, then yes, it is the employee. It's not um, the, the boss, if you will, or the owner or whatever. But the other thing is I find people learn at different rates and learn better with different people. So what I've done over the years is I will, like if, if I'm mentoring you and it's not working, I may say, David, you do it. And it, not because I'm annoyed, it's just because David has a different style and that style may be the style that you prefer. And I don't think, and I call them the 14-year-olds and they can be 14 or 114. I don't think the 14-year-olds today understand that because their, mental, uh, their mentality and attention span is about 35 seconds. So if you don't pick it up in 35 seconds, I think they're like, ah, you're done. You're no good. And I don't think they, I don't think they think past A all the way to Z. So I don't know if you find that with your clients yeah. when you're doing company honestly, culture things. I think another thing that's built into that too, if, if, if you weren't successful as an employee with another manager, that doesn't mean that you couldn't be successful with someone else. Right. And so we'll hear about, you know, not wanting to hire somebody that's been fired somewhere else before, or when we get a bad review uh, from an existing manager of that person or something, not to hire that person. To me, that's just, malarkey like i can't imagine right. subscribing to that in fact i'm i'm 100 tell me that you've been fired somewhere and talk to me about your experience about that um because i know there's a lot of bad managers out there so i'm assuming uh it's not necessarily your fault but also like the idea that you might just work better with what we're doing you might work better with my style than you did with those that person's style and if that was the experience that you had i'd love to hear about it you know what i mean and being open about those things Right, but yeah, I think one of the it's, things that stigma, right? Go ahead, David. Yeah, one of the things that that I always miss seem to miss out on all these conversations is that I once had a, a manager who said to me, "The issues are for not, are predominantly mine, because if you could do what I could do, you wouldn't be working for me. You'd be doing it yourself." So, my task is to accept your shortfall. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, so it means that one employee might be 80% of what you want, another might be 95%. And it's my job as a manager or as an owner of a company to see whether or not you, as the person that I've employed that I maybe that I like and, and the work that you do, that your shortfall is acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that it couldn't, that it couldn't be increased just a little bit, but to try and always squeeze everything out of the lemon, that doesn't always work. And you don't get the best out of people by just continuously thrashing them and, and trying to push them forward. So I might have a team of people where I've got 80, 95, 92, 93. I don't know how you how you feel about that, Kirsten. No, I think that makes perfect sense to me. And one of the things that, you know, our framework does is put people in a situation where they can be successful, focusing more on their strengths than caring about those weaknesses, right? Putting them in a position yeah. where let's let's utilize your strengths as much as we can. And who cares about the stuff that you don't, you know, do really well, doesn't light you up, isn't something that, you know, puts you in your zone of genius or whatever. Let's just let those things go. So I completely agree. Sometimes we just, you know, as a leader, we have to make sure that we put those employees in a situation where they can be successful. Yeah, because uh, Steve's and introduction was that he mentor. liked, yeah. mm -hmm. Steve, when you started the show, you said, yeah, I agreed 95%. Yeah. 
So yes. are we going to get are we going to get like half an hour of Steve's five percent now, or is it? Uh... No, 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 no. I, I I agree. So once again, I was brought up very old school in how and how yeah. you work with your supervisors, managers, and and from up to down. And our bosses, when I started out, would be they were very much like if their mentality was if you don't succeed, I don't succeed. So their thing is like if you the, you know you're only good at your weakest link. So I always told my team, you know, you're a family. You live and die together. If one of you screws up, then you all screw up. And and that's how I was taught. And what I found by that, it wasn't like kill or be killed, but you would find people mentoring people, and then it would elevate the team. And then if they came to me as a as a boss, they'd be like, hey, we have this issue. Then we can work through it. So I don't think. Um, I think the problem with managers today, and we've said this on our the other show, um, is they don't know how to manage. They don't teach this in school anymore. They don't teach anything in school anymore. But so people like Kristen have to be brought in, and I and I wholeheartedly like when people come in like her that have this foundation that say this is how you do it better. Because people mm -hmm. today they don't have a clue. I mean, you know, you can't learn to manage on TikTok. You can't learn to manage on you know Facebook. You can learn to manage, of course, on YouTube with this program. But you can't um, you can't learn that. And they don't read books like when I was in the seventies and the eighties. We used to read you know in search of excellence, and we used to read all these books about management and understand how you manage a team or a company or what you do. They don't do that today. They read these books like Ten Minute Manager. Well, no, it's not a ten minute manager. It's you have to really ingrain yourself into it because if you don't. How are you going to manage? There's different personalities. There's different everything. And yeah. if you don't keep up with everything, how do you manage it today? And that's what I think. What, that's why I was like, I agree with it 95% because I think there's that. They just don't know. So you know? so is it a situation, I guess, where, where um, uh, all, these, all these managers that you have get all their information out of books? Is that what they're referencing to these days? Uh, obviously, because um, they have a shortfall. If not, they wouldn't come to you. So, so where, where would be inter interesting to know? You know, as glo as a global statement, then mm -hmm. um, where 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 are all their shortfalls? Where are the most shortfalls coming from? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for my clients in particular, we often find that they found leaders in their organization through having people who are really good individual contributors that are getting sort of pushed into leadership, right? So these people aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily have a background in management. They didn't, you know, they didn't go to business school. These types of things are a piece that's missing for them. And I'll say most of my clients, if they don't start out as readers, they end up as readers because um, I'm sending them books. You know, I'm saying, hey, read this. Let's let's talk about this. Um, and, that, and they get a lot of information that way. Uh, but I think like learning from their experiences and going through lessons learned of the things that went well, didn't go well, me getting them to kind of think through what if we had tried this way? What if we had been, uh, say, more honest about this? What if we had focused less on these people's weaknesses and more on their strengths? Um, you know, what if we had approached this with a different kind of attitude? Where would we have been? And they're learning right in the moment from those experiences. So the clients that I have are long-term clients most often often. And they're people that, you know, over a period of a year, two years, three years, we can see that growth. And a lot of that goes back to learning in the moment from those mistakes. So we get to be involved enough where, you know, we're not just the consultants that come in and give you a set of recommendations. And then you can just figure it out from there. Uh, what we're trying to do is help them work through individual issues and grow like in that moment. Does that resonate for you? Well, I was thinking, um, I, you see a lot of circumstances where, no, I'll just make this a simple example, where you have somebody who's a fantastic uh, baker, you know, the mm -hmm. best bread baker ever, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, because he's really good at that, is then pushed forward to be a manager, where he has no skill set, and maybe not really a, uh, not really a deep-seated desire to be a manager, but has been around for so long, that you know, people look to him for what he could do about baking bread, but it's not 
you know, being a manager is more than just the technical side of it. Is, is that something that you see a lot in businesses? I know I have friends who are always complaining about, I've got, a, a, yeah, he used to be my colleague, he's a great technician, but he's a crap manager. Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 yeah, most that, often, that? most often that's what I see. That's mm-hmm. probably the most <laughs> common way that I see someone promoted to management. You know, the other side of that too, because we have some industries that are being taking a much more concerted effort of hiring that person that has had management experience, has been to business school, things like that. There's kind of a, I'm going to say an evil underbelly there too, where people look at that person, you know, you hire in a maintenance uh, supervisor who has no experience in maintenance, but they're a really good supervisor. And they say, how can this person, how can this person lead us, right? Because they have all the management experience. The best combination is, you know, somebody who has a little bit of both. That's, you know, the ideal situation, what we, what we want to see, but that's not, most often what we are seeing. And I can say from my own personal experience, I was with a credit union for 10 years. And at some point during that time, I ended up getting promoted to a chief of staff position from a marketing uh, senior management level position from marketing to chief of staff, being in charge of branches, being in charge of, you know, a call center, mobile banking, all those types of things. Uh, And my team said to me, my new founded team that I inherited, when I said, what's what's some of the concerns you have about working with me? They said, you don't know what the hell you're doing. You know, that's that's what I got, right? Which I totally respected. That's why I asked the question. And I was able to say in that moment, you are so right that I don't know anything about balancing a teller box. I don't know anything about what loan should be approved and what loan should not be approved. This is not my area of expertise, but I have a proven track record with my marketing team and other, you know, leadership experience in the past that I can empower people to be able to do their best work. So I'm not going to tell you how to balance the teller box. I'm not going to tell you what loan should be approved and what shouldn't be approved. Has that been an issue for you in the past where managers have kind of stepped in into your territory and told you how to do work? And they say, yeah, and they didn't know as well as I did because I'm the one, you know, who's really on the front lines. Cool. We're not going to have that problem here. Mm-hmm. I am just going to ask you, how can I set you up to be as successful as possible, right? And really have yeah. more of a focus on the leadership component and the culture component uh, than anything else, which is what I love to see. And like that senior level manager, for sure. But did that, did that result in then your your, your, your team being all happy bunnies? But uh, the people that employed you to take over their job, pulling their hair out, saying, you know, really? Is she telling everybody she can't do this? <laughs> no, I think it wasn't a secret. I think it wasn't a secret that I did. I wasn't a banker. I had made that very clear from the beginning that I had no intention of becoming the best banker in the world, right? All I wanted to do, I was very passionate about the mission of that credit union because, you know, credit unions are nonprofit. They're cooperatives. I love that type of model. So I was super passionate about that. Um, and I was super passionate about making sure those people got you know, what they deserved, making sure the members got what they deserved, you know, employees plus members. Uh, Honestly, you know, leaving that organization was incredibly tough for me uh, because I honestly didn't realize when I left the kind of impact that I had made on the employees and the kind of impact that I had made maybe even on the CEO. Uh, I don't want to, you know, speak out of turn, but uh, yeah, it was a really, really hard transition. I was very... um, I was integral to what was happening there. And, you know, then that's sort of where I wanted to start doing that for more organizations and not my own. And that's where the business came in, uh, came, came to be. Uh, but yeah, it, I think everybody was, you know, I'll say fat and happy at the end of all of it. So it was a really good experience for me. Uh, The first year, not so much, right? The first year, (laughs) tons of issues, tons of growing pains, tons of trying to establish trust. But the proof really is in the pudding with those types of things. And eventually you show people that that's a way that works. And, you know, people are happy. So so you come to my dinosaur managership. Yeah. So you you come to to my dinosaur company run by me, the dinosaur. And you and you come with all these like really hip and let's I'm gonna say it these very so sort of very American words, you know, culture and company DNA. 
And I say, well, look, you know, I make these widgets and I need to sell loads of them. So what do I want you for? What's all this DNA business? What does that mean mm. to me as a di What does that actually mean to me as a dinosaur company DNA? What's all that about? Yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. First of all, we uh, heavily qualify our clients before. So if you're giving me that kind of business, I might just be like, you wouldn't... maybe go somewhere else. You know, I don't know if we're... Well, I'll, 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 drop, I'll drop out of this interview now then that's the best way <laughs> <laughs> wait let's let's just take it let's let's go back one step then what is then the perfect there's, there's that that there is one but what is then the it's me you just look at me the perfect I, oh, I, I, I you're the dinosaur i got that um but you're going to be in a movie called jurassic park and jeff girl oh. is going to save you and with chris pine okay. you're fine. Oh. Don't, even, don't even worry Thank about you. that you're good so but Thank now you. Kristen's going to come in and she's going to make your, your Jurassic Park better. So what kind of client, you, I'm assuming you need one that's open because he's an owner. No, if he says to you, what are you going to do to make it better for me? I could say that's no. But if I'm like, I need your help, I'm assuming that's the client you want, right? Yes. Certainly okay. at the core of it, what we're looking for is a leader who cares about people. Fundamentally, okay cares what happens to their team. Now, we're not saying that they, you know, don't care about profits at all, that they don't care about their growth or anything like that, that we like people who are motivated in those areas as well, because it's a great combination of things. Um, people who fundamentally from a moral statement say, I want to treat my employees well, uh, and I'm looking to do really important things with my business. That is the key client for us. Um, so sometimes the clients that come to us are in a situation where they're wanting to tweak their culture. They, you know, have some pretty good things happening, but don't really have good systems in place. And, and that's where we focus from a culture standpoint is the systems level. Um, and so uh, they say, we don't have good systems in place. We're looking to grow. We're looking to merge with another organization or, you know, acquisitions, things like that. Uh, we want, we want to grow. We want to be bigger and we want to treat our employees really well while we're doing it. That's a really good place to begin. And then we have uh, teams as well that come and say, I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. Like, I really want to be a good leader. I really want this organization for everybody to be on the same page. But we need a third party in here because something's off and people are sort of like arrows headed in all these different directions, right? We need to get everybody aligned and on that same page. And um, that's another, you know, example of an ideal client for us as well. We love to see that huge level of growth in an organization. So when you when you come in, do you do an assessment? I mean, I'm assuming the first thing is a phone call, like, hello, how are you? My name is Dave, I'm a dinosaur. And then you're like, hey, we're gonna get oil out of you in five billion years. Um, but after that, um, then what happens is the assessment you do on the phone, and I'm assuming then you you spend do you spend time on on site or do you interview employees? How does the Take us through that process. Sure. If you would. sure. And we first start with a discovery call and make sure that it, it makes sense for us to work together, that we have similar values, that you want the same thing out of your business that we can deliver, those kinds of things. And once we've established that, uh, the next step we take is the assessment process. And so it's a pretty, I'm going to say rigorous process. We want to really uncover things, turn over some stones that haven't been turned over uh, in a while. And so what we'll do is we'll enter into um, surveying. And so we've got some surveying that we'll do that's benchmarkable and all those kinds of things. So we'll be able to look at you compared to other organizations. Um, we'll be able to do some focus groups. So we'll sit down with groups of people, you know, ask the right questions based on those surveys and really get to not just uncover the problem, but understand the underlying issues of why those problems exist. And then we also do some one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, like with leadership and things like that, who really mm -hmm. aren't appropriate to be in focus groups. Um, taking all that, matching that with other benchmarks uh, in their industry or um, their market, those types of things, gives us a pretty good idea of foundationally what we're working with. And from that point, then we start, you know, what are the next steps, right? There are several, you know, modules or programs that we have that uh, apply to most organizations, but we also do some customizable things as well uh, to meet those individual organizations needs. But every bit of it is created collaboratively.
So what we mean by this is we're not coming in and saying, oh, this is your problem. This is what you should do. Uh, just take this program, run with it and move forward. What we find, you know, that's that's not the kind of culture we want to create. We want a culture that enables stakeholders, allows people to, you know, buy in from the beginning. And so we're pulling in people from teams and saying, OK, here's some of the problems that we've identified. How would you solve these problems, right? So we're like workshopping that, facilitating that, taking them on that journey so that the answers really can be unique to them. Um, and this allows for much stronger integration and ultimately for them to make sustainable change and it not just be the blip of, you know, the flashy consultant that walked in and said a few nice things. Uh, that is my nightmare. Like that is my absolute nightmare. So we stay away from that. And then so mean, you, once we, we wait, wait, if I may, so once we bring you in, yeah. you do, let's say this 30 day review of our organization, which, mm -hmm. you know, or it's shorter or longer. And then is there like a monthly or quarterly checkup you do or to make sure that I'm following in the proper tracks. And then you go back at some point, six months, a year later and do a, another focus group or whatever and say to everybody, how is it today compared to back when? Yes. Exactly. So we're going to look okay. in a year, we're going to take a retrospective, go back to the assessment process and says, what's changed? You know, what things do we need to continue to work on? What does that look like? So we're checking in, you know, we almost become part of the team. I joke, like I, okay. I slip into, well, what are we going to do about this issue with this employee? What, are, what do we do about this? And I have to remove myself and say, okay, I don't actually work for you all. Um, but, <laughs> Um, you know, we stay connected in that way so we can see the evolution of that and be able to make yeah. tweaks along the way uh, to achieve that end result that we're looking for. Very cool. Yeah, I was, I was interested to, uh, as to whether or not uh, companies actually end up leaning on you. I mean, I can appreciate that you want to have the ongoing business and, you know, keep that portfolio, uh, you know, and, and of course the income going. But uh, are you are you a crutch for, do you become a crutch for, for some clients? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, I'm going to say no, absolutely no. And it's mostly because what we're doing is focusing higher on the purpose of creating that transformation that's sustainable for clients. So we're not looking to keep clients for the long run. I feel like that's such a, that sounds like a not sustainable business model for us. Luckily, <laughs> you know, people care about these things and people, you know, are looking for this kind of work. So that's that's great for us. But what we're looking to do is raise these clients up so that they can do this on their own eventually, right? So that they feel confident with this. Not that they wouldn't bring us in for other things, but we're not going to go on a full transformation journey with them because they, we've already done that once and it was super successful and they built the systems and they're just working the systems uh, and maybe even brought someone in in house at the end of it that's able to kind of take over for some of the things that we're doing. So uh, we've even worked with them to find those people to help recruit those people that would be a good fit for that. Um, so yeah, we, we don't keep clients forever and we're proud of that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we're proud of the fact that we're not going to say you're trapped here now. We have to work together until the business, you know, it's, it's dying days. Um, uh, you can be able to do everything on your own because it's really systematic and sustainable. It's a bit of a strange business model really, isn't it? A bit of a strange business model because you, you actually sort of build and burn your clients. 100%. So, uh, yeah. I yeah. think, you know, my business coach doesn't love it, right? That doesn't love the <laughs> idea that that's how I built the business. And, and your bank, um, your bank, cash flow people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, the thing is, is uh, I love it. We love it. We love this idea that we can really raise somebody up and say, you got it, guys. You got it. Give me a call. Give me a call when you have questions, when you need a, a further support. But um, yeah, it, it feels really good to see them grow up in that way. Very cool. Now, do yeah. you do stuff? I know I, I was reading stuff this last week on neodiversity. That seems to be the new the new topic. And I was, and I, and I went back through my career, and I realized that that probably, if we knew about this back in the day, you know, before electricity, it probably would have helped a lot of people, um, because people have their little whatever. But they said about twenty percent of the workforce is um, as neo diverse 
And I thought that was interesting. And I was reading about it and listening to the experts. And I was like, that's pretty cool. So is that something that you come in and take a look at as well? Could could we just... Could we just define what that means? Because there's another one of these really trendy words that come. You know, it's not for. trendy. It was in the FT. If it's in the FT, it's not trendy. It's a word. Um, wow. Neodiversity is for people that may have, um, it could be um, autism, Asperger's, whatever it might be, um, sensitive to loud noises, sensitive to whatever. And they can't take, if you will, in that a proper, just say you start out in the mailroom and you want to be the CEO, but because you can't go to a cocktail party because it's too overwhelming for you, you can't be the CEO, which is BS, but you do everything else right. So what Neodiversity is trying to do is trying to make your workspace good for you. So you're 10,000 times more productive than not. And also to understand that you may have limits and then you build a team around what your limits are. So you and your team are successful. So it's really just to help oh, people we have, that have issues. We have software houses here which just employ uh, people who are autistic. Mm-hmm. Right. Simply because they, um, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're, the numbers mean so much to them. Philips, for instance, the, the you know the huge multinational, they have a whole team of um, of autistic people, which they which they deliberately employed, and they go around all their stores to check out how all the displays are set, because these people can scan really quick. And, right. you know, it's the, literally that sore thumb is not it's like the Eiffel Tower, you know. It's wrong. Come and fix it. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah there, there, I think people are, are are slowly waking up to the fact that, uh, that we're all different and that uh, uh, there doesn't always have to be yeah. a square peg 14, to put the round hole 14 away. billion years. That's all it took. So, <laughs> but no, that's why. So with what, what Kristen's doing, I would think that neodiversity would possibly play um, – a role in it because yeah, I would think that you're going to come across people. Well, it, is, it more so, did, is it more so that the companies then become aware of that slightly different person that is working for us mm-hmm. um, needs to be put, you know, in a, in a different environment to get that little bit more out of them? Or, oh, uh, you know, yeah, that's a really good point. I think one of the things that we are we're fundamentally focused on making sure that that individual employee is set up to do their best work and that's what everything kind of goes back to how can we help that individual employee do the best work possible and so whether we're talking about neodiversity or whether we're talking about you know some sort of disability that that person has uh maybe they're a mother and they're you know breastfeeding those kinds of things whatever that situation is we're looking for ways to accommodate that in a positive way that allows us to have a bigger pool of candidates that doesn't knock out you know say we're not friendly to breastfeeding mothers or whatever so uh we don't get people who are like that to work for us if we're not friendly to people you know who maybe have some neurodiversity or something like that then we're not friendly to them and so what we're trying to do is open up that live in a state kind of going back to what you were just saying a moment ago living in a state where everyone is vulnerable enough with each other that it's okay to be vulnerable to share this is something that bothers me or doesn't work for me because i have this chronic illness or i have this you know neurodiversity or whatever it is let's work on accommodations for that um and what what we mean by this is not in this way where we're saying uh everyone's you know uh, this is what we get some flack for sometimes like everyone's entitled to be treated you know with kid gloves all the time or anything like that really what it comes down to uh, the 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 fundamentals of it is how can we get the best work out of this person I mean, that's what helps our business, right? That's what helps if we can put them in a situation where they do their best work. So that helps us. But also we believe humans fundamentally want to do good work. Humans fundamentally want to meet our expectations and be proud of what they do at work. So we're setting them up so that they can feel really proud of what they do and that they can get the most out of their career as well. So I think, you know, whether, whether it is, uh, you know, w- one term or another term or those kinds of things, it all fundamentally goes back to treating people at that individual level um, and being able to provide whatever it is that that person needs. Is that a question then coming? 
So is that a question that's coming from management then? Um, we, uh, we, would, we would like to be inclusive because we see and hear the possibilities of that. Or is that something which they are, yeah, we've got, we've got these strange people working for us and we don't quite know how to, you know, how to deal with them? I would say both, both are the case, both are the case. And, and often, you know, when we sit down with the focus groups and we say, you know, what are things that could help you to do your best work or what are things that are getting in the way from you doing your best work right now? We uncovered these things that maybe management didn't even know was a problem, probably because they never asked the question that we asked, right? <laughs> Which was, yeah. what could we do? What could we stop doing or what could we start doing that would help you to do your best work? But that's another thing. You always have to teach managers how to manage because 100%. they don't know. I learned, I learned coming up that managers had no clue. The best managers were the ones that literally just gave you the tools and they said, here's everything you need. If you have a yes. problem, come see me. And then you as the team said, okay, we've got all of this. What do we do? And then we figure it out and go do it. Um, mm -hmm. But also we would treat our teams like, I always do a joke, it's like, you're, that's your family. That's, there's your work wives and husbands. So if somebody falls short, you've got to pick up, you have to help them. And I find that if you, and that's my management style. My joke, my, the joke is I manage like Winston Churchill, Groucho Marx, Genghis Khan, and Tilla the Hun, which is probably very true. So there's not a lot of kumbaya moments, but people also know if they come to me, I will get what, we'll get what needs to get done and we'll get you what you need. Um, and if there's a problem, we make sure. And that's how I was taught. And I don't, I see managers today, like you're saying, oh, everyone's, they're not entitled. You're the boss. This is the way it is, but I will give you what you need to be successful. And if it literally means you need a better chair because your back hurts, I don't, that's fine because it's going to make at the end of the day. And, and I think this is what managers miss. The little things will help these people do better, which helps you do better. And once a quarter, what I used to do is take my whole team out with their family to dinner, not on the company dime, my dime. And like the controller used to say, because they go, oh, the company, the controller's like, no, no, that's his money. Like, there's no expense report for this thousand dollar dinner we just had. That's me. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that brings everybody together. So there's got to be, and like, this is what managers are missing, right? Get yourself out of your phone. You're like, you're not curing cancer. And if you are, great, be on your phone 24 seven. But you have <laughs> to spend time with your team. You have to do things that mm -hmm. bring you, like, make you a team. Because if you're not, I don't care how good you are, how good your people are, how good the company is or your management style, nothing. Because, you know, if they feel like they're an island, when things get tough, an island doesn't do well, a team does well. And I think that's hard to drill into managers sometimes because I don't think they get it. Um, no one's ever taught them that. And maybe you know, they've never so. seen it. Like maybe they have right. never been a part of an organization where it was like that. And until you can demonstrate that feeling to them until they can see what that looks like sometimes you know it's just like you're speaking a different language I, like i remember when i was first in economics class and we were started you know talking through all of it i was like are they literally speaking a different language i don't i, I don't <laughs> get it i don't know what this means you know and then once i spent more time yeah. in it it was like oh this is just natural this totally makes sense in the same way i feel sometimes i stand in front of clients particularly those new ones Ones, that we have to give hope to the staff that this is not going to just be some other thing uh, that comes along that we forget about in six months this is going to be real this is going to be sustainable this is going to you know make big change and when i stand in front of them i have to almost like take them on that a journey of like imagine what it would be like <laughs> to go to work and be able to do the best work you could possibly do. Like imagine if you were having a bad day that your team was there for you and able to, you know, take over and those kinds of things in that moment. Imagine you have the satisfaction of knowing that all those people have your back because they share the same values as you, that you're going to be appreciated when you come in. Like imagine these things because they can't even imagine what that might look like. You know what I'm saying? They just have never had that experience before. And that's what we want to spread, right? With my organization, get people to think like you are worth 
<laughs> enough to be in an organization like this. So seek yeah. out these organizations where people treat each other well, that allow you to do the best work that you can do. They exist. And more and more of them are going to exist, you know, in time, the more work that we're able to do. Right. But I also think part of it, the managers have to give their expectations. And I found like I, when HR would interview people and then send them to me, I go, what did HR tell you? And they tell me like, yeah, that's wrong. And they would look at me like, what? Well, let me explain how this really works. And then I look at their CV and I would say, we'll know in two weeks if you can do the job. And they'd be like, oh, and I'm like, full stop, right? You're either going to do it or you're not just a piece of paper. But we also would joke with them and say, you know, Link, I would literally say this, and I didn't care what color they were or what their diversity was. Could care, I would say Lincoln did nothing for you. There's 168 hours in a work week. I get you somewhere between 40 and 80 hours. Of it. That's it. Those 40, I own you. After that, when you go home, don't care. Go enjoy. I don't care if I don't hear from you. But And people would look at you like, really? I'm like, yeah. I said, you need to understand what you're going to walk into. So you you know my expectations. You know the team's expectations. And you coming in now understand but because you know how hr is right it's going to be wonderful billy don't worry everything is great everybody we're going to hug each other no we're not this is like we're in the real world we're here to make and i find that being very upfront and blunt and uh, and yes. sometimes politically incorrect employees the ones that can't take that i'm like you won't make it here because mm -hmm. you know in finance our teams are a little different than the norm um so i'm like you you won't fit here and the ones that go i get it they're the ones that'll fit. And I and I used to say to our HR people, it's okay to talk to them like people. You can't yes. talk to them like they're a five. Like, Johnny, would you like a piece of candy? No, Johnny doesn't want squat. Johnny wants to. And, then, and they would look at me, but my teams would flourish. And all the other teams, they always have an issue here, an issue there. And they'll be like, why is the finance department good? I said, because mm -hmm. I tell my people point blank, this is what it's like to work for me. Like mm -hmm. during your interview, you will know what it's like to work for those four people I mentioned earlier. And if you can handle it, great. We'll mentor you yeah. and you'll be well, successful. So, some if of the disconnect comes some of the disconnect comes right from the get-go, isn't that? Because like you say, right. you don't Very true. They, they they tell you right to, they tell you all these porkies, porkies well, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> lies <Yeah>. then. <laughs> and in HR, you know, you're gonna earn this, it's like this, everything's everything's tickety boo, you know, you can do this. No, that's not how it is. You know, this is, you know, come, come and work for a while, work for a couple of weeks. I mean, and the whole system's stacked against you as well. You can't, I mean, if you're dating someone, it's just like the first person you, you get a chance to, to date. You're not going to marry them just because yes. you dated them. And yeah. it's the same with work. There's no, the system's stacked. Oh, you have to like, you have to be there uh, for, you know, two weeks or a month or, you know, just, just to, really to understand how to open the door or, you know and use your codes mm -hmm. for this and everything else let alone you know, do your job properly so oh, yeah no, I, just, I, I think a lot of what you're saying comes down to that expectations and being clear about those expectations the more upfront yeah. we can be about those things like here's what you need to do to be successful on this team employees love that Sometimes we as managers, you know, I, I've heard this before of, you know, that sounds like micromanaging or something. No, that sounds about, that sounds like being clear about what it is you expect. And when you can be clear in that way, people will meet those expectations. That's one reason I love a culture code. We implement culture codes for all of our clients and culture codes, you know, if, if you're not familiar with them, it's really breaking down how you expect to treat each other, what is acceptable behavior and what is not. It's less of the fluffy, we are innovative, whatever that means. We are, you know, we are, you know, these very generic things, but rather getting into the meat of it and say, when we say that, uh, you know, we are compassionate for our employees, these are the things that we mean. These are these, This is what this means. It means uh, that we, you know, keep our voices down and have kind conversations. It means that we don't gossip. It means, you know, you get further into those details. Then we can even go further with the gossip thing and say, so here's what we do when somebody comes to us with a piece of gossip, because we know it's going to happen. Here's how we handle that situation, right? And like, we're getting to the level level where we're just being super clear about it. And, and I get that, like you were saying, Stephen, about, you know, I would bring people in to my team and I would, 
I have to be really clear with them. Here's the thing. I'm going to expect feedback from you all the time. And I'm going to be giving you feedback all the time. You're always going to know. We're always going to know where we stand with each other. That might be extremely uncomfortable for you because you haven't been in an organization like that before. Um, so be aware <laughs> this yeah. is what you're walking into, right? Because otherwise it's going to knock you off your horse a little bit. You're going to, it's going to take you a minute. You're going to be dazed. You're going to have trouble getting back on the horse. Be aware of that right from the beginning that this is the kind of culture that we have. Yeah, from the get-go. Well, we used to laugh when we were back in the day. We'd be like, listen, people are going to yell at you. And then five seconds when the yelling is done and you guys are done jousting, they're going to go, we're still going to go to lunch. And they said, right. their feelings aren't going to be hurt. They're just going to be like, I'm annoyed with you. This is, I'm expressing, because today it's like you can't even raise your voice at the, my group, you, raise, you scream and holler, I don't care what you do. Jump out the window, <laughs> we're on the first floor, you're fine. But I mean, but everybody knows when it's all said and done, we're still going to lunch. Or we're still going to go play golf on Saturday. Like, we're all still one family. And I say to people also, you know, this is like a family. You're going to be spending X amount of time. And now with uh, hybrid work, not so much. But you still, I'm like, you're going to have arguments. You're going to have disagree. It's okay. You can raise your voice. Get it out of your system. And then when it's done, though, you you if it's lack of, you kiss and make up. You hug with it. We're still going to go to lunch. And I said, that's the mentality. And being from New York, and David hates when I say that because I get money from the state and the city. Um, but being from New York, we have a very different way of looking at things. Like in an office, if you scream, you could scream at the top of the lungs for 20 minutes at each other. And then when it's all done, it's going to be like, it was, well, we still have that appointment at lunch, of course. And we're walking out the door. We already forgot that we just yelled at each other, right? We're just, you know, blowing off steam. And I find different age groups don't, you know, like if you yell at someone under like 40, they, they're going to, oh, yell at this. Get up, you know, come on, grow up. I mean, yes, your mommy told you you were special. She lied. Um, yes, you got a trophy for coming in 300th. They lied. So in certain jobs, you know, you have to be at the top. So in what we do, we don't, there's no like sugarcoating. It's very much, you're either the best or you're not. And if you're not, we're going to get you there. But you know that when you walk through the door. And I think yeah. a lot of these companies now are so worried about, we're going to get sued or they're going to put a bad Instagram. You don't care. You can bad Instagram and TikTok me all day because I don't care what they say because my clients don't care about that. They only care what my end product is. And I, and I, think, I think that's being, part of the issue. Being clear about that expectation is important. Yeah. But one thing I, I want to make sure that is included here is this idea that sometimes we see this resistance to the younger generation, mm -hmm. right? Where we're saying they're like this, they're like that. They need to get right. with the program. But the thing about all of that is that is what's making up the majority of the workplace. That is what's yep. coming up. And so having that awareness of what helps them to do their best work is an important role of a leader as well, right? If we right. want to be able to have, because we we know there's as many good things about young people as there are bad things, mm -hmm. right? The same, same thing with older people, right? There's as many right. good things about older people as there are bad things. Um, so if we want to be able to accommodate older people to be able to work for us, younger people to be able, whatever it is, we're going to have to understand what's important to them yep. and make sure that we can accommodate that to the best of our abilities, right? That's how we get yeah, our and, best work. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I, that, that, to me, that, that to me sounds like a follow-up show because that's such an interesting, <laughs> yeah, so I hope. Yeah. really, I mean, you, again, you know, just, just, you know, accommodating people. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I hope uh, hope you have an obvious. The time has beaten us again today. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope you come back yes. to to follow up on that. There's so much more we'd like to hear from you. But um, yeah, that's that's uh, at our age. It's, it's time to have a morning nap. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You old people, you drive me crazy. I mean, no, David, please don't think. Kristen, thank you so much. Stay with us because David likes to do housekeeping after. And this is the, and Kristen's seen all this because she's seen one of our shows. So, mm -hmm. so I know when the rock and roll yeah. comes. Don't forget to subscribe and like. And if you want to get a hold of Kristen, all her information has been flashing on the screen, as well as um, we'll put it here in the link below. And if you're on the podcast, go over to the YouTube channel and you can check it out. Well, sadly, uh, this is the end of uh, today's show. Um, a really big thank you to everyone who contributed today to the show. And of course, uh, thank you to my co-host, uh, Stephen Oldfart. I'm David Oldfart. Don't forget, subscribe to the show and get all the latest updates 
from two old farts making noises.